All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Life Between the Six with Cody Cropper, your host, Brandon, and we are back with MLS Week 15 recap. Cody, guest time, keeping the streak alive. Yes, yes, Greg Garza, um, obviously former former MLS vet and U.S. men's national team left back. Uh, Greg, thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, we're looking so, forward to this. Uh, let's start off. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's start off, Greg. Maybe tell us a little bit about what you are doing post playing now. Yeah, of course. You kind of go, I think every player kind of goes through that like life and death uh kind of situation of trying to yeah. trying to find another life after uh what you've dedicated your whole life to. Um, beforehand. Uh, one good thing is that, you know, my my co-founder uh, at a company that we have called Beyond Goals Mentoring, Michael Parkhurst and I played together for two years here in Atlanta United. Um, we're able to win the cup together. And we always had this idea of trying to help, whether it were rookies coming in, whether it were young players, we saw so many players kind of have that God-given talent um, and just not understand the mental component uh, uh, piece of the game that they were missing. Uh, whether it was the confidence, leadership, resilience, understanding different situations, uh, just the 24-7 athlete mindset and the grind of what it takes to not only make it, but make it last. And uh, we had this idea behind kind of just helping young players and kind of nipping the bud as quickly as possible with young players. And we created uh, Beyond Goals Mentoring. And now we have the pleasure of uh, being involved and almost serving like a big brother to a lot of different players, whether it be boy, girls all around the country. And we do our sessions virtually uh, in person here in Atlanta. Um, I'm based in Atlanta. Michael's based in Ohio. So uh, we, we had this idea. It sparked about and uh, we we actually now have transitioned uh, pretty much full time into that from being just a little idea uh, now into about a full time gig that that's kind of helped us transition into that next that next phase in our in our lives after hanging up the boots. That's that's great. Um, you know, as a former, well, sorry, former, as a current professional athlete, I can say that the mental side of the game is the hardest because the ebbs and the flows, the ups and the downs, you don't know how to, you're never, most players, most people are never taught how to deal with that. And if you can learn that at a young age, you will be better off not only on the field, but also off of it as well. And most definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes giving, whether it's personal experiences or things that we learned from certain coaches that we had, um, sometimes mental coaches that we had, or sometimes sports psychology kind of coming into yeah. play. Um, you know, I always tell people that I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a person with a lot of background and experience, uh, kind of a, uh, a nomad, nomad and gypsy of the world of kind of, yeah traveling all over the place and learning so many cool things that, that, that helped Absolutely. me where, where I wanted to ultimately be. So um, now, now giving back to the game that gave so much to us is, is, is what we love to do. So yeah, you're, you're completely right. Very, Fantastic. very cool. Fantastic. We'll, we'll drop a link in the description as well. Um, because, you know, I think we've heard from a lot of these stories, Greg talent. Is, it only takes you so far because when you get to the pros, everybody's good. And so it's being able to, round yourself out and being able to handle ups and downs of being a professional. I know um, a lot of us fans just think it's all glitz and glamor. You guys are just living the dream. It's hard work and uh, there's trenches you guys got to dig through. So um, yeah, that's super cool. We, we appreciate you sharing that and kudos to you for just continuing to stay in the game and, and provide opportunities to other people. I think that's like the biggest gift you can give back in whatever area of your life is essentially helping the next generation come through. Uh, and making it hopefully a little bit easier um, because they're a little bit smarter, you know? <laughs> That's what it's all about. I mean, you said you said there's so many good players in a pro level. You'd be absolutely surprised the level there is within uh, youth soccer in the United States. There are so many good players coming through the ranks, and uh, you're exactly right. It's not about the God-given talent that they have at their feet that will take them the furthest and use soccer as their kind of catapult to get them as far in, in life as they want to go. It's it's more so how they carry themselves on and off the field and the personality and the character traits that will take them much further. No, oh, love that. Anything else from you, Cody? No, um, I just think it's incredible. And, uh, you know, to have played with Greg and to see him, 
you know, come full circle and now giving back to the game is, you know, like you said, Brandon, what it's all about. As a player, Greg, you think that uh, a lot of people call you mentor or were you in there kind of mixing up in the locker room being a prankster? What do you, what do you think? Uh, I, I was a jokester, man. I was definitely a jokester. Cody could probably say I was a big a-hole. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think that's, and, and this is something I think that goes for all players, right? Whether, whether it's kids that will only play in high school, whether it's kids that will only play in college, whether it's guys who have, um, you know, a, a successful career within the game or whether you play only a year or two, uh, the one thing I miss the most is the banter. Um, it's those relationships that you have within kind of that sacred locker room that, you know, nobody else really knows about and what goes on. And it's, it's honestly the making fun of each other that you miss the most. Um, and, and those little inside jokes or whatever it may be, that's that, that is, is by far the, the, the biggest thing that I miss the most and, and you can't get that back. So guys who are still playing, uh, you know, whether it be only high school, whatever it may be. Uh, those, those, are the, those are the moments that you have to cherish, uh, cause, cause they don't last forever. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, Cody, I can attest he's never grown up. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. That is true. I've hey. known Cody for a long time, man. I've seen this. That is true. I've seen this kid somewhat grow up, just grow in height. Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Somewhat. <laughs> hey, you had the perfect bridge here. You talking about that, that locker room camaraderie, the bus and the balls, it's got a little crazy in Toronto, gentlemen. I just have to bring it up right at the top of the show uh, before we even get into the conference standings, the reviews. Uh, there's been a lot coming out of the athletic talking about the um, the lack of a of a functioning dynamic in Toronto between manager, senior players in the squad, and then specifically uh, in senior name Bernadeschi. Uh, I, I hate to to put this out there, but Toronto has to figure out how to make this work because they're paying Insigne seven and a half million and Bernadeschi 6.3 million. They have a ton of money, Cody, tied up in these two players. And I know Bernadeschi was dropped at the, this past weekend and they won without him. But like, you can't just in the MLS, right? Sit 6.3 million for the season. No. Um, and I don't think any organization or coach in their right mind would do that. However, if the team is better without him, they might look to move him. I mean, you think, I just think back of our team with Atlanta United and we had, we had some personal issues go along with Ezekiel Barco in the 2018 season that we won the whole MLS mm -hmm. cup. I think, I think Barco maybe only played about five or six games that whole season. And this was a guy that just won the Copa Sudamericana with, um, with, oh my gosh, uh, I even forgot maybe Independiente or I forgot where he played before. Um, but I mean, a guy that's probably on 2.5, $3 million and played maybe five or six games the whole entire season in 2018. Wow. Um, and that is a huge signing. Maybe he played a little bit more, but he wasn't, he wasn't given the value or the worth that obviously they had initially signed him for. Um, and he was more of like a super sub at, at some point in time, but, um, it just goes to show that sometimes personality is, is much more needed on the field. And, um, you know, you want, you want a good locker room, you want yeah. a good locker room wherever you are. And if there's going to be drama that's created, every MLS team has one payout they can use a year. That's, that's uh, true. and so, you know, there were, those guys are probably looking towards what they can do to make things better. But if you lose one, you know, one Italian guy, I mean, I go to Toronto a lot. I travel to Toronto a lot. That's where my girlfriend lives. Um, but you know, there's a lot of Italians in Toronto. Uh, I'll go yeah. to the game on Wednesday, this next Wednesday. So I'll let you guys know what the, uh, what the drama is like and what the atmosphere is like. I'm sure. I mean, every game that I've been there so far um, within the past year and a half. Um, I mean, a lot of Italians fill that stadium. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that speaks volumes to the homework that the organization did because they went out and they signed two players that spoke to the demographic of Toronto, knowing that it would not only fill the stadium, but it would also sell jerseys. It would make them money in other ways. And uh, I just, I don't know if it's fair to Bob because I don't know if Bob went out and was the one that signed these two players or said, these are the two that I want. However, there's got to be some accountability at some stage 
to have not done the homework in terms of knowing they didn't get along before they signed both of them. Like you didn't ask Insigne? Hey, what do you think about your fellow countrymen? Not a yeah. fan. And I think that's what surprises me the most about this all was the potential lack of due diligence or mm -hmm. if they just got excited because they're like, hey, we can sign this, this good winger from Juventus coming into the MLS. We already got Insigne, you know, from Serie A. We'll just kind of create this niche. And if, if Greg, you're saying there's an Italian, um, you know, population there and it really play into it, I, I'm sure, you know, they got him for 10 million uh or no he got a free transfer it looks like even so it's all big numbers but like he they don't even like each other and what that means is now uh everything that insigne gets bernadeschi wants he wants more money he wants the drake contract he wants the mls media day like when's it it's just never gonna stop and that's why i do feel like it's tough because it seems like if some of the quotes are true about calling bob Bre or Michael Bradley, Bob Bradley's son, and some of the other players, it kind of seems like the respect factor is gone between a lot of them. And that's what you always need at the end of the day. You don't have to be best friends with someone, right? But like there has to be mutual respect in a locker room. And it seems like that's kind of been broken now. I mean, you, you look at most clubs as a professional athlete. I mean, Cody, how many guys did you hang out with on Revolution when you were there outside of the locker room? Three or four. Yeah, probably not many. And yeah, I can probably say that even within my career of all the teams that I played for, maybe two guys, every team that I actually yeah. hung out with off the field. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where you say, right. That's where you say, Brandon, that, 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 that respect has to be at least on the field. And if that, if that disrespect is now creating drama off the field, then you, you know you know things you know there's bad blood in training you know there's things that are happening within training because that that translates and, and, and transfers over so um it, whether it's a whether it's a shot at ego whether it's a shot at whatever it might be um it's it's difficult to see you you want you want that organization to be successful because you know i think you you look at you look at toronto's first 13 14 years in the season i think they never made playoffs or maybe maybe i might be maybe i might be uh getting that number wrong and you can correct it for me it might be the first nine or ten seasons but uh within their first i know maybe over a decade within the league they had never made playoffs so you want you want that you want that club to do well just because of the legacy after mike bradley and josie outdoor being there um you know yeah. you, that club to be a successful side uh, because Toronto fans are great. I will tell you that Toronto fans, whether they are supporting the Raptors, uh, you know, whatever it may be, every team in Toronto, uh, they have great fans. The, the one crack Cody, you've, you kind of asked a couple of different guests we've had on about Bob is he under pressure, this and that apparently in senior said he wasn't going to come back. If Bob was manager, clearly Bernadeschi now isn't happy with life under Bob. They're in second to last place in the East. Now there's bigger conversations being probably had at the club and GM level of like, all right, what do we do now? Bob or the Italians? <laughs> like, I know it's not that simple, but like big, big conversations have to be had about Toronto. Yeah. Cause I think if you look at their results and their performances last season, when they brought them in halfway through the year, they still weren't, what you would have expected. And I think that there was some slack given to Bob just because Insigne got injured in what his second game coming in. Uh, then Bernadeschi picked up an injury and, and, and maybe there was some, some understanding that, okay, now we're going to get these guys in for a full preseason. We're going to, build the organization. We go out and we sh sign Sean Johnson. We go out and we sign Matt Hedges and we add the pieces that we need, but it just doesn't seem to be gelling and, and, and cohesive. And I don't know what upper management or the organization does, uh, whether it's Bob or the Italians, like you said, it's not that simple, but um, something's got to give somewhere. All right, we're going to take a real quick break. Cody is bringing another sponsor to the table. Who do you have for this episode? Uh, 
This episode's sponsor is Pancakes Pancakes. It is honestly one of the most incredible things that I have found in the last year. It is protein packed pancake mix. Obviously, I'm a big protein guy. Uh, helps me stay on top of my game, helps me feed my muscles and feed my body. And this stuff works. Uh, 15 grams of protein per serving, only 160 calories, 16 grams of carbs, and only 4.5 grams of fat. It is gluten-free, low carb, and low calories. And nice. they have tons of different flavors. So go and get yours today. And it looks like it's dummy proof, right? Just add water. Anyone can make them. Yeah, exactly. Just add water. I actually add a little bit of milk, adds a little bit of more, uh, you know, a creamy texture. However, hey, you know, it works. It also works in a waffle iron too. So you can make Ooh. protein packed waffles too. Or mug cakes, which I have been a big fan of recently. All right. So a little versatility in there. Hey, just add liquid and you go. Uh, protein, great way to kick off the morning. So uh, we're going to jump back into it, though. Hope you're enjoying this one. Pancakes, link in the description below. Well, silver lining here, all right, is it they won at the weekend. 2-1 over DC United. Uh, they got the win without Bernadeschi, and Signe was clutch for them in this situation. Kerr in the 14th, Thompson the 72nd, getting the goals for Toronto. Benteke doing the business for DC United. Um, so... You know, Greg, for them, it's probably like, hey, on the pitch this weekend, if you just took this in isolation, like, hey, all is well. If anything, it maybe gives them a little confidence. They can win without Bernadeschi. Maybe they're like, hey, we might have some flexibility here. And then on the opposite side, DC, who you think are having a relatively decent season, Rooney triple subs in the first half and comes out after the game goes, I wish I had 11 subs. You're just like, well, that was, I wasn't expecting that this weekend. <laughs> you look at that DC team and it's such a young team. So, you know, I think I think Rooney has really taken advantage of trying to produce a lot of players and give a lot of players opportunities. And sometimes I feel like maybe it might be his veteran mindset of maybe Rooney's players veteran mindset of kind of sending these boys a message. Um, and, and I think that, you know, wanting to make 11 subs is, is probably sending those kids a message that uh, all of those guys are dispensable. Um, and sometimes you need sometimes you need young kids that, that are having opportunities to play to realize that they have to they have to continue to make their spot or, or gain their spot in a way that's you know just doesn't come naturally and easily um as as they think it will be so um i mean kudos to for for rooney to do that because i think it, it's great to send messages to to young kids that are coming through the ranks and have the opportunity to play and um, you know, he's, they've been having a, a pretty good season so far with what they have. And I mean, we can be very honest with what they have isn't, isn't much, uh, in comparison yeah. to a lot of other clubs that are big spenders within the league. Yeah, hey, I would agree. Hey, Cody, he made his subs in the 45th plus one, 45th plus two, 45th plus two. Dude didn't even wait for halftime. Mm, that's tough. That's tough. That's 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 <laughs> not the never second minute. Not the thirty seventh. Like mentally demoralizing if you're coming. Yeah. Up. Hey. Yeah. So uh, hold not on. even waiting to have right there is brutal. Yeah. Tunnels right there. Uh, we'll meet you in there in about thirty seconds for the talk. <laughs> yeah. That's that's tough. Um, you know, Are I you feel saying? I feel for those young players. However, um. It is a learning curve. And like Greg said, you have to, when you get the opportunity, you have to take it and you have to show that you not only deserve to be out there, but you deserve to stay out there. And I don't think a player of Rooney's history of uh, that has Rooney's career is going to sit there and watch a game pass him by knowing that he has players on the bench that can make a change or, you know, make an impact. Yeah. Durkin Durkin's 23 who came off and Cudi Pietro uh, was 21. So definitely some younger players there. Uh, flip it real quick, Greg Toronto. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess all is well after this massive leak, which I thought would have rattled the team, but clearly there's enough of a core yet in this clubhouse to say, we're pros. We're going to go do a job. You, you have to, you have to think so, right? The next game is against Chicago on Wednesday. 
So you're, you're facing, it, it could be, there could be light at the end of the tunnel for them very soon because you're facing a Chicago team that has been, I think, in rebuild mode for the past, when did Schweinsteiger come? <laughs> uh, I think 2016. So, you know, it's, uh, there's still, I mean, and you still have Shakiri that's now there that that's probably competing for them with the highest paid player within the league. Um, and so he is, he production. is the highest paid player. So production, production level there, you look on all sides of it. It's going to be, which th- those three DPs right there have to be the highest played. I think in my, they have to be the highest paid players, right? I those have it up because I did my homework. Shakiri is, uh, his overall comp is 8.15 million and Senior's two at seven five, fully guaranteed. Chicharito is seven four. Yeah. Um, and Bernadeschi is six three. So out of the top they're, four, they're one, two, and four. Let's see. Let's see what production you get from I'll tell you. I'll be there on Wednesday. I'll be there on <laughs> love that. What yeah. it, it, level you get from your highest paid DPs in the MLS. Yeah. This, the sideline scoop there. Uh, love the transition opening for me because we can go into New England three, Chicago three, right? Yeah. Chicago yeah. on a goal tear. Now they can't defend and they're bleeding <sighs> goals, but these are lights out games all of a sudden. Revs a bit of a slip, Cody, right? They they were top yeah. of the standings or down to third in the East. Uh, Chicago, if nothing else, after sacking their manager, which a lot of people thought was a bit unfair, um, they've changed formation. The new manager is, is shaking them up and he's at least brought some light life into this team. Yeah, definitely some attacking life. Um, that said, they are bleeding goals. Uh, I think eight in the last three, I think. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So, um, and they've only scored six. So they, they do have some work to do. However, um, you know, bringing it full circle and back to Shakiri. I, I mean, Shakiri. I don't know if he's if it's worth what I think what did we say last week or two weeks ago, 40% of Chicago's payroll. But um he is starting to find a rhythm and add to Chicago's offensive prowess, which is what he was brought here to do. Um obviously had uh, an assist on the first goal and then an incredible switch of play on the on the side volley uh that led to the second goal. Yeah, I think there are still stints within even all three of those players that I'll be able to uh, hope, hopefully, well, I'm, I'm sure Bernadeschi will probably not be called to the game again. But, um, you know, all of those players can change games within seconds if if they want to. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's 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 tough to see you, you have that you have that stigma around you because you're making so much money in, in a league that I think that. And in my personal opinion, has shown so much more growth within unknown DP players rather than players that are just so very known within the world. Um, but I think highlight of that game, I'm kind of changing courses there. Highlight of that game is Josie Altador scoring. Um, I think the last goal that he had was in September of last year. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so, uh, I mean, kudos to that guy getting a goal. He's still got some goals in his career, still got some goals in him. And there's no way that guy can like soccer anymore. I, I can't, there's, uh, I gotta be tired of soccer. Um, I would guy, agree. since he is 15, 16 years old. So, um, yeah, good, good for that guy. Yeah. Um, and, and also Bobby Wood scoring. I know Bobby since coming back to the MLS hasn't really, lived up to the hype that surrounded him coming back when RSL signed him. Um, and, you know, it's obviously good to see him out there and and getting a goal. I think the last goal he scored was actually in Toronto versus Toronto. So um, it's definitely one of those things where you're seeing two former U S men's national team strikers, you know, start to maybe add a little bit to new England's attacking prowess. However, uh, I think that you did see New England's ability and the the ability that got them to the top. And obviously, they've had a recent slip. However, you know now you're seeing young 
younger players come through the ranks there and you're seeing the team's ability to persevere uh, through difficult times. Obviously going down 2-0 to Chicago is not mentally what you would, where you think you would be uh, going into that game, if that makes sense. Well, just to round that out, we might as well shout out that Zarda scored too for Austin. So <laughs> keep that. That's true. Keep the former U.S. men's national uh, team striker dream alive. Uh, yes. Man, um, you know, both these managers trying to shake up some things. Buck with another bomb from him. Absolutely knows mm-hmm. how to put his foot through the ball. Um, two young goalkeepers going head to head, Petrovic and Brady uh, trying to make a name. George A's just had a, a, a rough run, which just coincided with New England slipping a little bit. There's still a lot from this team. I always say this, Greg, like the MLS, you walk in and, and every single weekend, I look at the the results from top to bottom, and I'm always floored by a couple of results. And every time I've been asked this question every way, they're like, yeah, MLS is crazy. Anyone can beat anyone on any single given day. How do you kind of like follow these swings and things with the with these different teams? And how quickly does form come in? Because we talk about travel and grass and turf and all, I guess, more variables, maybe other leagues. And I don't know if you want to compare it to Liga MX or what, but, um, or Europe or national team, but it, MLS is, is a unique thing in the world of soccer, isn't it? it? It truly is. And I think that's the biggest adapting piece to most foreign players coming to play in this league is that they have absolutely zero idea of how this league functions. And it's either you really, you grab onto it and you you understand it very quickly, or it can take a lot of time or you just never get it. Um, and I think if you are an American player and you're an industry or industrial player, that's kind of, you know, you, you know, your role, you know, what you can bring to the table, you know, what you, you know, how you can perform and, and kind of you know, be that uh, invaluable piece to your team. Um, you can, you can have a great career, but I think there are a lot of players that come from different places within the world. And it, sometimes they're just not able to adapt to how, what you said, how unique the league can be, um, whether it is travel, whether it is, I mean, now, now you, now you have the ability to fly charter, right. But back in the day, you, you didn't have that. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different pieces, a lot of different moving pieces that play such a huge role, um, and how unique the, the, the league can be. And, I just, I just always remember the conversation of being, you know, the last four years of my career within the league, but just thinking to myself, you know, as long as you win at home and you try and get something out of playing away, um, I would love to know the percentage rate of a team winning away uh, within the league. It's got to be extremely low. I, I don't know if there's even a stat for that, but what the percentage rate of teams winning away has to be within the league. It's got to be such a low number in comparison to probably every other country that there is uh, that that has a league in the world. Um, it's got to be because I just feel like yeah. you said all the other variables that come into play uh, just just make it so difficult to sometimes grind out points within this league. I absolutely agree with that, and I think we've touched on that in a previous episode. And the difficulties of playing away are without a shadow of a doubt, tougher in in Major League Soccer than any other league in the world. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest reasons is, like you said, Greg, the travel is is unmatched. Um, In other other leagues, you might hop on a one-hour flight um, same day, most same, of the, same day of a game though. Right. It's like, you're yeah. the same day. It's, or the night before you're hopping on a, fl- a one hour flight and there's, or you're on a three hour bus ride, you know, like that's uh, what a lot of my travel in the UK was, was three or four hour bus rides, or you then, or you were hopping on the train for an hour and a half, whatever it might be, but you're not getting on a three and a half hour flight or six hour flight going from Vancouver to Miami or vice versa, and being expected to to perform the next day or, you know, two days later even. Because, yeah, uh time change as well, right? It's like, yeah, time change, three hour time change from coast to coast. And it's, it's very difficult, very difficult. Well, the last one I did want to touch on uh, is Kansas City 4, Portland 1. And Kansas City, and I, I kind of joked before the pod, guys. And I, I think it, I think it landed well. So I'm gonna say it again. Kansas City is like 
late. They're like opposite of tanking. They like slow played everyone at the beginning of the season. Vermees got the extension. They got some injuries back. They're trying to find their form. And the last couple of results, they're starting to burst on the scene, Cody. Uh, yeah. You know, we we talked about Portland in another episode. Uh, you know, what they have to bring to the table. It's probably with Zarek, actually, uh, since since Z-Man was there. But their, their last few matches with SKC, right? 4-1 over uh, Portland. Obviously, they got rocked 4 nothing by, by St. Louis. 1-1 Kansas City. Beat Minnesota 3-1. Beat Seattle at home 2-1. Yeah. They're not great. But again trying to put a couple of results together. They're no longer bottom of the conference, which for them was really kind of the goal uh, in the Western conference and LA galaxy is holding that spot. Which is a different conversation entirely, but um, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I think that they've had a great response the last six weeks. Um, You know, they're three, two and one in their previous six games, which is a lot better than what they were in their first eight or nine. Um, I think a big factor of that is getting Pulido, Kinda, and Russell on the field all at the same time, or at least two of the three on the field at the same time, because those are their, those are their three DPs. And in the first, I think five to eight games, they weren't on the field together in any capacity. So um, the impact of designated players in this situation is crucial to their success. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think you you look at sporting KC and you look at how successful that I think they've always just always been such a tough team to play against uh, throughout the years. And the past few years have just been, it's gotta be demoralizing for those guys that are, that have been there for so long. Um, Even for, even for, even for Peter, right? It's got to be one of those things that you you see you see so many ups and downs, peaks and valleys of what you've been through, and trying to use those as learning curves or learning experiences, and now teach that next generation of players that are coming through. Um, because I do feel that there is so much history of success within that organization. Um, they've always been good in the past few years. They've just truly struggled to kind of show that superiority and, 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 and what they stand for. So, um, I, I always, I, I always enjoy watching them play just because of their style of play, um, how they always implement their style of play, but it's, it's, it's tough sometimes to, to, to see those organizations. Once again, like I said, Toronto, you, these are organizations that you want, you enjoy seeing them be successful because of the fan base, because of, um, you know, how cool those cities are because, Right. There's, there's there's things about those certain soccer cities that as even as a player and even as now a, a fan, you want you want those you want those cities to be successful. For sure. I would agree with that entirely. Well, we'll have to see how they continue to shake and move on their side. Uh, is there going to be going to uh, well hosting Dallas next? So who who have been a little bit tricky. Uh, Portland. I mean, again, they're just in and amongst it. Right. They they're ninth right now in the West. Um, only four wins on the season, seven losses, four ties. Um, they, they've, I don't know, I guess I don't, I don't want to pass judgment on them. Um, minus having one of the best kits in the league, but um, I guess I thought they'd be a little bit more settled, but I, I guess Cody, am I missing something with them as far as injuries, returning players? I, I mean, honestly, I, I think, and I think Greg would agree with me. This is Portland to a T the last five to eight years. They are hit and miss in the first third of the season. They start to find a groove maybe halfway through the year, and then they hit form towards the end of the year and always make a playoff push. It It, it is truly fascinating how they – can never seem to figure it out at the start, but always figure it out by the end of the year. And in this country, that's what it's about. It's about playoffs. And um, it, it doesn't matter if it's soccer, NHL, NFL, NBA, whatever it might be. It's about getting hot at the right time. And Portland uh, historically has been able to do that. I, I think the two things I, I completely agree with you, uh, Corey. I think the, the two teams that really stand out to me always that are like that is Portland and Seattle. Those are the two yeah. teams 
I always feel like and Seattle is almost like a difference maker this season because they've actually been doing really well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I think to see those two organizations, they somehow always make playoffs. And that's uh that's that's ultimately what you need in this league. And yeah. coaches sometimes don't change in those organizations because they simply always find a way. Giovanni's yeah. been there for quite some time now, and he's been successful in continuously and consecutively making playoffs. Yep, I would I would completely agree, and I, I think um, for the first time in like fifteen years, even maybe more longer than that, Seattle didn't make it last year, but that was because of all the injuries in and the yes. and the champion. Yeah, exactly, the Concacaf Champions League that they went into and and had had to deal with and there were a handful of uh, of factors that played into that however they missed playoffs but i think by one or two points last year because they made a run right at the end and like you said those two organizations always find a way to find their feet find a rhythm and push for the playoffs and more often than not play each other in the Western conference in a later, later, the uh, later than earlier round. Well, we'll have to see how it shakes out. Remind this is only game week 15. We got a lot of MLS. We got a lot of leagues yeah. cup and all these other things going on to cover, yeah. which will be great. But Hey, Greg, like, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for coming and bringing uh, a little bit of the Atlanta perspective, right? Bringing the, the, the vet, perspective and sharing your story about what you guys are doing, uh, mentoring kind of the, the next generation of, you know, hopefully MLS superstars. No, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be on with you guys. I mean, for, for me, it's, it's, it's really fun to now have, have an opinion, um, and yeah. be able to share it, um, and, and not get judged by it. I think that's the coolest thing as well, because you are a fan of the game. I'll always be a fan of the game. Obviously there's so, I still have so many friends that, that are still in the league and you want to see them do well and you want to see them perform. You want to see them continue to, to flourish within their careers. And, and at the same time, it gives you uh, an opportunity to kind of, you know, give, give your two cents on what you think is going on and happening. And um, this, this league is, is so far different than any other league I ever played in, been involved in or watch uh weekend week out on a, a you know, on a, obviously on a weekly basis. So um so much can happen within a few days within this league um and there's always things to talk about so thank you guys for having me on yeah brilliant cody we'll be back with more content as always uh it's like and subscribe the five star reviews go a long ways on apple Podcasts and spotify but hey we'll be back with week 16 uh until next time have a great week enjoy it we'll be back